Uh, good evening, um, everybody. Uh, good evening, Scott and and um, and Zena, and to our um, viewers um, in the world. Uh, I am Andrew Hui, and with us in this Renaissance studio low uh, this evening or morning is uh, Zena Hitz and uh, Scott uh, Newstock. Uh, Zena Hitz is a uh, tutor at St. John's College, Annapolis. And Scott is a professor of English at Rhodes College. And what brings us together uh, this evening, this morning, is that um, all three of us have um, published books recently from uh, Princeton University Press. Zena's book is Lost in Thought, The Hidden Pleasures of a Intellectual Life. And Scott's book is How to Think Like Shakespeare, Lessons from a Renaissance Education. And my own book is A Theory of the Aphorism from Confucius to Twitter. And I should also say that I teach at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore. And U.S. stands for the National University of Singapore. And my uh, school is a liberal arts college um, that's founded by Yale University in New Haven and the National University of, of Singapore to create one of the uh, first liberal arts colleges in uh, Southeast Asia. So um, I'm really excited to uh, have this um, conversation because I feel a special kinship uh, to both Zena and uh, Scott. Uh, uh, both Scott and I are a professional, professional early modernists, though we have very wide ranging interest. And um, I blame my wide ranging interests uh, to uh, my education at St. John's College. That's where I received my, uh, my BA. So uh, without further ado, uh, Scott, why don't you just give us um, a precy of your book? This will be your first progymnosmata exercise. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. The, the book emerged out of two parallel strands. One was reading a lot of great scholarship over the last decade about the kind of education that Shakespeare would have had in the 16th century, as well as the collaborative material, immersive theatrical practices that he would have been involved in in the London theater. So a, a lot of fascinating work has been done on thinking about what were, what were the intellect, intellectual and material conditions that allowed someone like that to flourish, a whole community of writers to flourish at that particular moment in time. So that's really changed my teaching and I've, I've enjoyed bringing that work to bear in my, in my pedagogy. At the same time as I've been thinking about humanist and 16th century and, and uh, educational practices, my own three children have been going through various stages of schooling. And some of it's been really wonderful and some of it's been really frustrating. Uh, they have, I think, borne the brunt of a, a series of national reforms in education all of them initially well-intentioned, but sometimes with really counterproductive consequences. And the, the more I thought about what was frustrating to me about their educational experiences and what I thought was still valuable and viable about uh, 16th century Renaissance educational practices, the more I, I feel like I was forced to try to articulate what some of those valuable practices still were today and how we can continue to hone them and refine them and recuperate them, not, not jettison them entirely as being backwards or, or outdated, but rather mm. think of them as enduring edu educational practices that really transcend eras as well as disciplines and nations and, and peoples. So that's, it, was, it was the kind of convergence of those two strands that made me feel like I wanted to articulate to myself what I really value about education all the way up from the primary school level to the mm. secondary, post-secondary and graduate school level. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, Zena, your turn. Uh, sure, so um, my, my book also grew out of uh, a, a series of personal experiences. Uh, I um, was, had a transformative experience as an undergraduate at St. John's, uh, fell in love with uh, the, the great books um, and became a scholar in classical philosophy. And uh, over the years working as a scholar and teaching in mainstream universities, uh, I, I felt uh, more and more a conflict within myself between the, the, the humanist that had been formed uh, by liberal arts and 
the ambitious professional who had been formed by uh, elite graduate programs. Mm. And um, this was a, a very much personal crisis. So I, I, I left the profession, joined a religious community and spent three years in the, in the, in the woods stewing over things. And uh, when I came back out and decided to go back to St. John's, I, uh, I wanted to try to articulate for other people and for myself uh, what that tension was, what, what the sort of scope of resolution might be, what was valuable in um, professional academic life. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not an outright rejection, um, but what, what also does it need to keep in mind to preserve itself? And, and my conclusion was something like there's this human activity of, of learning for its own sake that human activity is something that's good for human beings, something more or less universally available. Uh, and that's the good that needs to be kept in mind for education, mm. it seems to be at all levels, especially not nonprofit uh, education. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to try to articulate that as an ideal um, and then also to, to look at some of the ways in which it might become uh, corrupted or redeemed in practice. Um, so that was that was the thought behind the book. I, I wanted to to uh, invite uh, mm. both readers like myself, who, who disaffected academics of one kind mm. or another, but also people who uh, might be ordinary people who like to learn, mm. who mm. might not uh, recognize that what they're doing is this uh, beautiful, wonderful thing that's in a certain mm. way the splendor of a of a human being. Right. It deserves some some honor and glory. Absolutely, and humble the circumstances. So th that that's the basic idea behind. Great, it. Great, thank you. Okay, now that our listeners have a rough idea of what your respective books are about, um, let's do a little uh, Saint John style uh, seminar. And a Saint John style seminar is that a um, tutor. Um, I'm not pretending to be a um, tutor at this moment, but uh, someone will ask an opening question, right? And so the opening question for uh, both of you is. Uh, both of these books were written uh, pre-Trump's um, um, impeachment and, and acquittal, uh, pre-COVID-19, pre-economic um, turmoil, pre-George Floyd, pre-protest, um, um, police br brutality, uh, violence, and um, events that have reverberated um, across America and, and globally. So. Um, in light of this, were you writing this book today, uh, what would you have um, done differently or how would you have reflected um, upon this present crisis that uh, we're in? Or, or perhaps um, there's something um, not of the moment, right? There's something um, timeless about uh, what you're trying to uh, work out in your books. Go ahead, Zena. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> easy, easy question. I suppose I the I think what I'd want to say is I, I don't think I would change anything. Mm. Um, the, the things that you mentioned, impeachment. I remember another impeachment. Mm. Um, I remember many other um, uh, black men uh, abused or, or killed by the police, and many mm. other um, series of of protests. Mm. Uh, that's not to diminish that this moment might be special in some way. Mm. I hope that it is on that question. Right. Um, likewise, the economic collapse uh, was one not so long ago, 12 years ago, 2008. Um, so I think much of what we're seeing is a kind of... Um, it's been there all along. Crystallization of things that have been there all right. along. Um, and uh, part of what I... Um, you know, I had an experience, for me, when I was in graduate school, the, the great uh, historical moment was the, the onset of global terrorism, the bombing of the mm, world, yep. terror, the war yeah. in Iraq, and Afghanistan. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, those, those seem smaller now than they did then. Mm. Uh, but they had a very similar sense of urgency. That is, you know, I felt at the time as a graduate student that I had yeah. to go out and uh, make a difference in the world. Mm. I think um, that involved a certain kind of misunderstanding. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that people shouldn't go out and, and uh, respond to these crises in the way that feels them appropriate. But 
um, you have to ask yourself, it seems to me, whenever you're um, thinking about what goes under the category of making a difference, mm, right. what's the final vision that you're aiming for? What's, what's mm. a good economy? What's a healthy economy for? Right. That's a great uh, question. What's justice, what's justice right. for? What's yes. interracial justice right. for? What does it yeah, look absolutely. like? Absolutely, right. And I think when you get into those questions, you get into the questions that classically mm. the question of eudaimonia or happiness. What right. does there are more philosophical, the, the perennial questions of the human condition, oh. right? Uh, what is justice? Is right. Um, Mencius asked that. Uh, Plato asked that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so what does human flourishing look mm, like? Absolutely. You have to always ask that question, yeah. and not just ask it in like an academic mm. way, but have that kind of questioning right. be integrated to our lives in mm. some way or other, no matter what we're doing. Right. Sure. So, so Scott, what is? Yeah. yeah, Scott, what is human flourishing like? <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer to that, but the no, I I, I totally concur with what Zena is saying about the the moment crystallizing or intensifying things that have always been present, um, and I think it's I, I think I, I'm always cautious about let's let's put it this way, moments of crisis do often demand responses to the urgency of that crisis, right. while I also feel like I want to try to balance the sense of. The, these things intensify or or maybe open up right. old wounds that have always been present. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, uh, the, I, I don't think there is much that I would change about the book. You know, one of the things that's tacit but comes up a couple of times is our, our radical inequality in the distribution of of education. And mm -hmm. you know, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a multi-generational right. fact in the United States right. and globally and and right. throughout time, that's always been mm -hmm. the case. And whatever we can do in the long run to ameliorate mm -hmm. that is to the good, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, if I have some vision of, of human flourishing, it would be a version of more universal mm -hmm. access to right. the things that we love right. and the things that we care about. And that to me, that doesn't change. Uh, you know, part of the book pushes pretty hard as Zena does as well in favor of small in-person conversations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Those are, you know, costly mm -hmm. and time consuming sure. and they, they don't scale. Right. Uh, and, but I, I, I don't feel like I've changed about that in the midst of the moment. I mean, if anything, mm. my sense of what's happened with, uh, with quarantine and people needing to teach online is, I think it's actually revealed that it's not a terribly satisfying format mm. for large group discussions. I mean, right. I think this is a this is almost the maximum the three of us here mm. that that the medium is suitable for. Mm. And I, you know, I why do we feel exhausted when we're when we're done with a Zoom conversation? All all kinds of reasons. One mm. good explanation that I've seen is it it has a kind of excess of the data that we don't need right. and, a, a, yeah. and a poverty of the data right. that we that we do need. And those of us who have been in a good complicated seminar conversation know that there's all kinds of nonverbal signs mm -hmm. and body language and sighing or quizzical looks that are almost impossible to pick up in an on online group mm -hmm. discussion. Right. So it's I I feel I still feel strongly that the there are extraordinary virtues of the demanding yeah. time consuming, costly, intensive conversations in person that have not been replaced. Uh, by the online fora that we've been forced by crisis to use. Again, I'm, right. I understand why we're all doing it, but it's, I think we can also say it's not optimal and, it, and it's not an ideal. And I, I presume that your students have expressed dissatisfaction with it, I think. Right. I mean, we can- Yeah, Zena, I mean, um, like yeah. Uh, Jacob Klein and Stringfellow Barr and Scott Buchanan would have never conceived in their wildest dreams, right? In, in these lands unknown and accents, right? <laughs> <laughs> accents unheard right? <laughs> no but i i i i think that they they would say just what scott said which is right. <laughs> well now we can see how much better it is to talk in person you know mm. right. <laughs> than it was to talk on the, and I, I think one of the things that's edifying right is to see how the students react to it um yeah you know, students across the country maybe around the world have just right. given a big thumbs down to online mm. uh, right. and that, that's yeah. That for me is encouraging. Uh, right. 
because it, it shows that they, 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 they're perfectly aware of what, of what they need. I mean, the thing um, that I've heard, I've been impressed that I've, I, I agree, they're perfectly aware and they've, I think they've had a pretty clear insight into what's been lacking. I mean, one thing that came up again and again in my one-on-one -on -one advising conversations was a frustration at the lack of motivation that they, mm -hmm. there's something about being in the room and being on yeah. task with other right. human beings that right. it keeps you to account in all kinds of ways that they mm -hmm. maybe hadn't fully thought through. I mean, this even goes back to Zena's point, I think about Malcolm X's mentor. I can't remember the name of the individual, but it was, you know, that library was available to Malcolm X, but it, mm -hmm. what really was needed was the individual mentor who was mm -hmm. able to say, hey, how, why don't you read this? Or have you thought about this? Right. And I think, you know, that's been the case since the invention of writing in any form, it, it could always be the case that you could read things or you could mm -hmm. go to a library or you, now you can go online. What's lacking is the, is the motivation and the, the human mentor to situate your mm -hmm. path in some way. Right. And I think that's, it's really just hard to reproduce right. that online and the lack of motivation mm -hmm. has been stark, I think, for, for students. Then again, I mean, um, I was motivated to set up this um, interview and this conversation precisely because of Zoom. Uh, I, I'd never heard of Zoom and I never, I mean, I'd done Skype before, but never this kind of multi-local, uh, multi-person uh, seance, right? This <laughs> uh, online um, symposium. And um, I feel like, you know, um, it would have been extraordinarily difficult to bring three of us scattered throughout the world into one location, right? It was um, tough, but not impossible, you know, for us to figure out, I mean, literally we're 12 hours away you can't get you know i can't get any further from from you two so uh, zoom at least for um i'll just put it this way for scholars um living and working in the peripheries of knowledge production right um in a non-us centric uh, world it's given us new possibilities and new horizons of communications that would not have been possible Right. I wouldn't have even dreamed of that. Oh, you know, I can have a conversation with uh, two interesting books that I've just come across. Right. So um, maybe I'm a little more hopeful about its um, latent possibilities. But I, I wonder, so for what, as, as you early modernists know, the, the, the correspondence was once the way that this took place in the world. The public yes, the epistolary. Yeah. So, right. so that's one thing. But the, the other thing is that I, I wonder whether, so I've had a similar thought. I, Zoom, I, I'm enjoying this conversation, but for me, it's, it's Twitter, which I, you know, in, in principle, totally opposed to, yeah. but through which I've found a number of people who ah. are sympathetic to right. the kind of work right. that Scott and I are doing. People yeah, who you are do have a Twitter account. So for our uh, listeners, or so it's <laughs> at Zena Hits. <laughs> Scott, do you have a Twitter? Um, yeah, I don't do Twitter. So right. the point was that um, we're at a moment uh, in the U.S. at least of uh, really pretty intense institutional decline, or I might even use the word collapse. Mm. Uh, and in a time like this, we do actually need to connect with people that might not be local in order to try to use each other to figure out. Yeah. What to, you know, some strategies for how to move forward. Um, right. So I, I think it does work for that. And I think, you know, Zoom is a part of that too. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do I, think ultimately we'll never, we'll never recover education mm -hmm. in any mode other than person to person. I don't think I would, will And again, I would add, I don't think this contradicts what you just said, Andrew. I think my, my sense is that online mm -hmm. fora like this work best the, the work, the higher, the higher you are in terms of your life and your education and your experience, the 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 better suited is it is to these kinds of conversations. Yes, and I've heard I think that's true. Right. Corporate world that so if you're having mm. a, a meeting of VPs at your organization, right. this is a fairly efficient way to have a mm -hmm. conversation yeah. like that. If you're trying to orient a new class of hires, it, yes. it doesn't yeah. work as well. Really and the right. and the further you go down, in you know. For my seven-year-old, it's been a catastrophe. I mean, it's, mm. I mean that's sorry, that's right. that's not fair. Um, it, it's it's not conducive to the kinds of human dynamics that mm. are developmentally, I think, right more important. The, the right. younger you are, as yeah. well as this is also socioeconomic. I mean, if you've mm -hmm. seen any of the studies about um, Zoom participation or online participation for. Yeah. Uh, non uh, non first language speakers, uh, immigrant communities, uh, 
students from poorer backgrounds and other disadvantaged yeah, circumstances. Um, it, it has been catastrophic at the primary and secondary yeah. level in, in the transition in the last three months. And school, students that are from better off backgrounds and have more access to internet and so on, have it's not been as catastrophic. I, I just wanted to throw in there that the intellectually disabled children uh, I know have had it. absolutely it's really yeah. it a zoom class is really totally unworkable you need yeah absolutely person. well maybe what we can say that is you know we're having this great conversation right now precisely because we've had decades of training in seminar tables right so uh, this is the next best thing but we're making it work right and so um, and it just makes me think about um, techne and logos, right? Technology in, in two different ways. You know, um, Scott, in this great chapter on, on craft, you does this beautiful thing about how, um, you know, we use techne as in, um, you know, really at the forefront, you know, of, of innovation and, and technology and so forth. But techne is actually quite archaic in the one-on-one um, -on -one um, sense of craftsmanship, right? This transmission of knowledge that can't be articulated, right? And um, so, you know, it's just two different ways of thinking about techne. One that is future oriented, always thinking of breakthroughs and um, innovations, right? Um, you know, I think Mark Zuckerberg's motto or his aphorism was um, move fast and break things, right? That's technology, right? But what you're saying is that there is this older sense of techne, which is not about breaking things, but about transmission, this uh, care, this craft. I, I heard someone say that the, a, a counter motto should be move slow and maintain things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's, that's the political <laughs> ideology, right? Between uh, liberalism and conservatism. I don't, I don't know. I mean, right. it's, it's, it, it's not catchy in the same way. It sounds, mm -hmm. it sounds backwards. It doesn't sound, I mean, it's, we- Right, I mean, we like um, iconoclast, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely our moment is is to disrupt and to right. break things and right. uh, this thing is outdated and it needs right. to be destroyed or it's yeah. backwards looking. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just think that's regrettable because I think mm. it it's it, it creates an un, unhelpful dichotomy or right. an unhelpful binary that's not accurate. Right. And it's not to say that everything from the past mm. has to be right. maintained in in amber, frozen in amber. But at mm. the same time, it's such a it's such a lazy way to to see the telos of of the moment is always mm. forward looking and always right. Right. this new thing is the most important thing. So yeah, I mean, I just I'm just pulling on the old deeper sense mm. of techne as having any anything that we use to shape human activity. So even something as simple as the common class time. I, again, I think this is this has been exposed as something mm. that's incredibly productive and needful in the in the kind of weird asynchronous mm. world in which we've been right. forced to exist that right. walking into a room and sitting there for 50 mm. minutes or 75 minutes or whatever right. length of time no matter how arbitrary yeah that is a that is a weird techne that is a Absolutely. weird sense of, right we've we've invented this thing which is sitting around a table together for a certain yeah. span of time and certain mm. things can happen Right. within that time that can't happen within a shorter or longer span of time mm -hmm. or or not even together at all. So yeah, Zina, obviously, right. go ahead, yeah. So I, I, I just wanted to say that what, one of the things I think that really comes out beautifully in Scott's book is that uh, when we think about tradition or about maintaining things, it sounds very rigid and controlling. You know, mm. we want to do what we've always done and you can't mm. do anything different. But in fact, it's the opposite. That is, it's the past is is not a, a a rigid set of guidelines, but a kind of a soil. Mm. How do what right. new grows, right. and the alternative is not, um, you know, real spontaneity. It's mm. it's repetition. It's doing mm. the same thing over and over right. again in a way that's uh, monotonous and deadening right. and shallow, um, right. and and frankly conformist. Uh, right. So, I think. I think that's one thing that Scott brings out really nicely is mm. that that um, what you might think was true, which was right. that the old is rigid and hard fat and mm. high bound, mm. and the new is freeing. It's in mm. fact the worst. It's it's getting in touch with um, what's old that allows mm. us to, to shape ourselves right. spontaneously as something new and different and free. Mm. Uh, and I, I that's you know if I could mm. shout that rooftops. Yeah. 
you know, I would. You know. So, so here's a um, maybe an ethical question. It's really about the ethics of reading, right? Um, Scott, um, in, in one chapter, quotes from, I don't know who, but, you know, he says, um, tell me uh, what your attention is um, drawn towards and I'll tell you who you are, right? Um, it's kind of like, you know, you know, Cervantes, you know, says something, oh, tell me what you read and, and I'll tell you who you are, right? So um, every time we pick up a book, um, we make a conscious decision and say, okay, I'm reading this book and not another book, right? So I've been having um, uh, these, you know, self critiques and saying, if that's true, um, am I, you know, I, I was born and raised in St. John's, you know, all white dead male, you know, curriculum. Um, how do I respond to uh, someone who would say, oh, you're just uh, perpetuating white supremacy, right? How come you aren't reading Malcolm X? How come you're, you know, you're not even reading any Islamic texts, no South Asian texts, no, okay, you know, St. John's has an Eastern classics program, but then my um, colleagues will say, uh, what about the global south, right? <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you have eastern and western, that's pretty reifying. So uh, the short of it is, aphoristically, um, at this present moment, should I go back to reading Plato's Phaedo on the immortality of the soul, or should I read the two New York Times bestseller, How to Be a Racist or White Fragility? Because I read Phaedo again, I basically know what, I mean, it's going to deepen my knowledge, right? But I actually don't know what anti-racism is. I have some sort of understanding of what white privilege, I mean, even though I'm not white, I mean, I'm Asian American, right? Um, um, or what, uh, you know, the current, you know, buzzwords are uh, virtue signaling or performative allyship. So I, I suppose um, nothing that we do at St. John's or nothing that I promote in the book is about not reading certain things. Mm. So it's, it's never about not reading. It's never exclusionary. Mm. Right. It's, we have a certain amount of time. What do we spend that time reading? Now there is a principle of selection there and that principle of selection is seen as morally fraught and maybe it is. Mm. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the things I think is not fully recognized, okay, so you mentioned Malcolm X who's uh, autobiography I have loved ever since I was a young person. Uh, I still think about Malcolm X. He's a part of my uh, right. thought world, so to speak. Now, how was Malcolm X educated? He read the great books. Mm -hmm. How was James Baldwin educated? Mm -hmm. How was Maya Angelou educated? How was he? Huey Newton in the interview says that the first book he read seriously was Plato's Republic. Uh, you know, Douglas, Du Bois, all, you know, the, the whole panoply. But what, what would have happened if um, Malcolm X read the Ramayana instead of the Odyssey instead? What would happen if he read, um, you know, the Chinese historian Sima Tian instead of Herodotus? What would happen if he read Thousand One Nights instead of Boccaccio? He, and he may have read all those things. So there's, there's Eastern classics in his prison library too. I actually, one of these days, I have to go figure out what was in that library, uh, which I haven't done. But um, but I know that he also read Eastern things as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, it it doesn't mean somehow that his education is defective. Um, mm. it, it's it's that mm -hmm. he's so it's how you're thinking about it. Right. So the yeah, I, I mean I'm on your side, but it's a real but um, not, ethical not, question that I struggle with like every day. Uh, think about it this way: the books he read uh, provide liberated him. Right. I mean he or he liberated himself through the right. books if he wanted to put it that way. Right. Um, now, um, could he have been liberated through other books? Sure, probably. Uh, so it's not that somehow we're deciding that other books don't liberate. Mm. <laughs> we're teaching some books that liberate. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, um, I think the notion of a canon has really in a way misshaped mm. our conversations. Mm -hmm. um, they're as good as any place to start. Right? Mm. Now, is, it, is the canon something fixed and eternal? No. It grows, it changes, it responds. Um, what happens? So we have students for four years. They read the books that we read. They never want to read less of the books that we read. They never want to take a book off. Very mm. rarely. Right. They want to take a book off. They want to read more. Mm. Uh, that to me is a sign of tremendous success because that's exactly what they should do. 
Mm. They should leave. They should read more. If mm. they're interested in Chinese philosophy, they should go study Chinese philosophy. If they're interested in figuring out what's going on with contemporary writing about racism, they should read that. So there's not, and, and then I think with the growth of a community of readers, then you, everyone on an equal footing who's read some of the same things and some different things, mm. what do we do in the Republic of Letters? Well, we try to communicate to one another the value of what we've read and encourage mm. others to read it. Right. That's an organic process. Mm. It's not top down. And one of the things that disturbs me about some of the current uh, movements is that it's very top down. Some consultant tells you what to mm. read. Mm. Uh, that's not how it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, we should, as a community of learners, figure out what we think is most interesting to read and most valuable mm. to read. And that's, again, not a fixed and rigid process. It's a mm. free process. An organic process it's a growing process right um, but it it's slow right you know it doesn't respond to the moment mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, it doesn't pick up on um this news item or that one mm -hmm. and it can't because right. learning takes a long time scott what do you think oh i mean i think i'm in accord with what both of you are saying the i guess i would just make two i think basic practical points that are just elaborating what Zina's describing about a community. Uh, one is the practical point of uh, a, a contemporary community of readers. Uh, again, St. John's is an anomaly in the American higher education system of having a, a coherent four-year program of reading. You know, where I went as an undergraduate Grinnell, we were at the other extreme of no mm. general education requirements. And there were, you know, spontaneous communities that emerged of overlapping readings. Mm -hmm. But there was no, there was no structured coherence across the curriculum, mm -hmm. and you know where I teach now is a somewhat of a hybrid of a more typical hybrid of having the elective system for your major, but a general education requirement mm -hmm. track, in addition to that to supplement that, which mm -hmm. you know has a long history in the United States about why that emerged in the in mm -hmm. the early twentieth century as a as a compromise. But I think I think there is something to be said for reading anything in common. No, ma no matter what, no matter what it is that 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 allows that community to start to emerge, whether that's a, a contemporary op-ed or a three thousand year old document. Mm -hmm. right. And then separately, I think the the other practical point that I think is, so far as I can sense, suffused in the St. John's curriculum is there's there's also a historical or a diachronic history of of that community of readers. So when you have a a genealogy of Malcolm X read this, who 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 read this. You, you're entering that longer conversation or that longer community. And it's, it, I think it's a loss to not at least have some of that made accessible right. to you. So you right. can, otherwise a lot, of the, a lot of those conversations just look bizarre because you don't know right. who John Locke right. is or you don't know who Mary Wollstonecraft mm -hmm. is or you have no yeah. idea who Aristotle was or right. who Maimonides was. So yeah. um, in some ways, providing that infrastructure allows you the liberty to then do whatever you want with it, right. but at least you're able to have some handholds or footholds within that longer conversation. Mm -hmm. And because those other readers read previous writers, right. you, you are yourself part of that long right. conversation then too. Yeah, um, I mean, point well taken. And maybe um, I've just been, you know, I spent four years um, thinking about the great books at St. John's and I've spent, you know, the past 18 years out of St. John's kind of thinking and rethinking um, this notion of, of the canon. And just this week, you know, I discovered, um, you know, two amazing early modern women writers, Francesca Colonna, who was, um, who wrote beautiful letters to uh, Michelangelo and uh, Lucrezia Marinella. And these are published, you know, by uh, University of Chicago Press, um, Other Voices. But um, I began to think, you know, I have a PhD in Renaissance literature, but, and I studied with some like amazing scholars at Princeton, never did they once tell me anything about these women's writers. And I think like, they're just as awesome as Petrarch or, or Galileo, right? Or um, nobody ever thought, you know, told me about what Africa was happening in the Renaissance and the beating of the slave trade and, um, you know, the Colombian exchange of, um, uh, you know, talking about viruses and, and talking about pandemics, you know, 90% of, um, of, of the native population, you know, perished because of, um, uh, of the disease that, you know, white people 
brought. So I felt like um, I wasn't able to discover that until I kind of discovered it on my own, like much later. And I claim to be an expert in this, right? And so there is a way in which, yes, of course, um, uh, you know, a canon is never a fixed thing. But within this uh, four years, I just feel like, uh, again, this is, you know, coming from somebody who loves St. John's. It's not even St. John's, but just loves the great books, right? There must be some ways of finding more diversity to think about um, Islamic voices, South Asian voices, right? Um, yeah, do you want to respond to that? Or, uh, can, I, can I actually just ask you a question? I mean, sure. what do you think, what, what do you think the voice, when you're saying like a, a right. woman's voice or a South Asian voice, right. what do you think goes into it being a voice? That is, what, what are you missing? What does the, what right. does the diversity okay. yes. add to your right. experience? Yeah, exactly. okay, right. I think um, this diversity has to do with, um, I guess, you know, what is called identity politics these days, right? Uh, gender, sexuality, race, social economic class, right? St. John's likes to pretend that um, we go beyond that, right? At one point, uh, you, you cited, you know, Du Bois and saying, you know, he's able to have conversations with Shakespeare and Balzac, and they see him beyond the color line, right? Uh, there are some of my colleagues who say that, no, um, I don't want to see beyond the color line, because uh, color and race is intrinsic to who I am. Like, Lucrezia Marinella is speaking as a woman, and she can't pretend to, um, to write and speak like Leonardo Bruni, right? So um, it's precisely um, their identity as the specific individuals, right? And not, um, and I think for them, in a way, uh, maybe this isn't the right word, but they're like anti-universalist. Yeah, Scott, do you want to jump in? And then we can have a real kind of, you know. Um, oh, I'm not ready to jump in. I thought Zena was oh, okay. going right, right, okay. <laughs> to pick yeah. up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't want this entire conversation to revolve no, I know. around me talking to, you know. I mean, St. John's uh, yeah. Tutor, I, right. I'm still a baby in certain ways, and I can't right. tend to talk too much, so you've got to keep okay. doing that. Um, yeah. And, you know, if Scott's trying to get in, and I'm, right. or I'm over talking over him, you have to. But let me just say, say this. So I, the, um, this is something that I don't, th there's a set of assumptions built into identity politics that right. need to be untangled. Mm. Now, I have my own assumptions too, and I try to be as, as clear about them as I can. So I believe there is such a thing um, in the sense, not in the sense of an objective object of knowledge, but as a kind mm. of form of aspiration of mm. human nature, what it is to be a human being. Uh, it's something that we seek for. Mm. Uh, it's not, there's no science of it that's then passed down. So I think that any book um, there are books that are good, that are worth reading, that are informative, and then there are books which can form the backbone of an education, uh, that, so that are fundamental in some way or other. Mm. Uh, so part of my assumption is that there are such books. Mm. Um, mm. Now, there are a lot of books that could be like that, and mm. you have to make a, you know, you, we, as we've been talking about, you make a selection. But those books that are foundational, I think, have to tap into the universal. They have mm. to tap into what's human. I think truthfully, any book yeah. does that. I don't think communication is possible. And right. uh, the deeper the communication, the less possible without a sense of connection to the person who's mm. talking. Mm. And, and if that person's particularly distant, that connection is going to be very deep. It'll be human and, and not much else. Mm. Uh, so, um, so I do think that, but I also think that um, the, the examples we've been talking about testify to the fact that what you read, the gender and the race of the authors you read does not uh, control you. Uh, it is not a restriction. So no one thinks, for instance, Jane Austen, right, who's one of the few women that we read at St. John's, no one, no one reads Jane Austen as a sort of neutered human being in the abstract with all of her particularities removed. <clears throat> it's a very specific time. It's a very specific place. It's, it's very much um, topics that were central to women of that time. Uh, she's not erased. Uh, neither, for instance, 
I mean, Malcolm X, who mm. we've been talking about, yeah. of all people, mm. is not erased. Mm. Uh, he becomes uh, a black nationalist in prison. I mean, mm. his parents are also black nationalists. So there's a question about whether, it, but he, he, he commits himself to that. Now, mm. that's someone who read a lot of things about being a human being and who, and, and what did he come out to say when he becomes an activist, mm. right? He's like, we right. are human beings. African, you know, African American rights are uh, black people's rights are human rights. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, without uh, that universal, yeah. I think I, I think to give up that universal is to give up more than anyone right. really wants to imagine. Mm. You're losing um, forms of aspiration, forms mm. of community, forms of communication. That uh, that that to lose is, I think, a catastrophe. Right. Right. The universal. Um, okay, Scott, do you want to uh, respond to this, or uh, I, I have lots of other questions about. Um, you know, stuff within your books and also just larger macro questions. I just have one quick, again, one footnote, I think to what Zina was saying is the, if you look at curricular debates, not only in the post-secondary higher education realm, but it, at the primary and secondary realm through, at least through the lens of the common core, which has been fairly, it's been revised and modified and, and adapted, but that, that in some ways crystallized a lot of the, the tensions that we have about whether we do agree on something in common for reading in particular, mm. you know, the common core shied away from any difficult debate about whether we could assign anything to a, a quasi-national curriculum other than the easy answer of Shakespeare, which is regrettable. It puts a right. bizarre, unfortunate, counterproductive pressure on one figure mm. and then isolates that figure from an entire universe of writers from other nations and languages and you, mm -hmm. you name it. So that I think is, I think that's unhelpful and distorting in all kinds mm -hmm. of ways for students as well as teachers. But it is, it does, it is a kind of odd signal that at least for that conversation about a decade ago, there was just people throwing up their hands and saying like, there's mm -hmm. no way we can ever say people should read Jane Austen right. or people should read Frederick right. Douglass or people should read X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Well, except for Shakespeare, but then we just give up on everything else. And then the default mode is to moving towards skills and skills. Right. Yes. Uh, abstracted skills. Of, yeah, yeah. of any, right. of any content kind of right. free floating yeah. skills. And I think that's. Right. And skills that's also presuppose some sort of T loss, right? Because what are you using these skills for? Right, so it's also kind of um, at the end of the day, it's about the use value that has to be um, quantified, right? So, but anyways, let's, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna shift the conversation um, a little bit. And um, one of the peculiarities that I've found, um, you know, um, having written a couple of books is that um, contractually, you don't really um, get to, uh, 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 the, the book title is not yours, right? Um, the pub, it's, um, it's always a negotiation between the author and the um, publisher. But in any case, I do want to think through um, the titles. Um, if um, your book is about lost in thought, uh, what is found in thought? Um, and for Scott, um, uh, I love this title and I love the chapters, but honestly, um, at the end of the book, um, I have, uh, you've given us the tools, the skills uh, to think like uh, Shakespeare, but um, what is Shakespearean thinking? What does Shakespeare think, right? How is different than what, right? So um, um, you have, you know, how to think like Shakespeare, but what does, what does Shakespeare think? Well, I, I, I dodged that question. I think, I think in some ways, what, this is an old point that Kenneth Burke made about Shakespeare. Kenneth Burke is one of my heroes who right. is trying to adapt the long rhetorical tradition to contemporary American mm -hmm. concerns in the mid 20th century. Yeah. And I, I think Burke has a, his intuition is right that part of what made, what makes a great dramatist, and this is kind of the Borges insight about mm -hmm. Shakespeare as well, is that right. it's an absence of the core of thinking. It's yeah. someone who's attuned to right. network, net, networks of voices right. and is and yeah. loves the play of mind right. and loves or tension. It's what uh, uh, Keats called the negative capability, right? Yeah, it's that, what gives um, Maya Angelou the right to say, you know, Shakespeare was a, a black girl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's, that, that's a, in all kinds of untold and unanticipated ways, that's yeah. part of the secret to his long-term 
success so and adaptability. Would you say that Shakespeare, Shakespeare is a relativist and not a universalist then? I don't know. I mean, I think Shakespeare is, I, I think the way he constructs plays is very anti doctrinal. I think part of the dynamic, part of what makes the plays work is that they pose often irresolvable tensions. And, uh, mm. and it's not necessarily the case that one comes out on, or I mean, you have to have one come out on top for the end of act five, but in mm. terms of sustaining that tension or sustaining a series of thoughts, in some ways they're, you know, very much in the spirit of, of the dialogue tradition, of mm. whether that's a medieval dialogue or Socratic dialogue, mm. the sense of, hmm, well, I, I think this, well, actually that's wrong. And mm. I'm the kind of antagonist for that. And then mm. there's a third voice that intrudes upon that. So I, I don't know if that's really what he, I mean, I don't think you can ever say what he thinks at the core, yeah. but I think if anything, I'm, I'm arguing for a kind of dialogic, anti-doctrinal, um, multi-vocal tradition mm. that, that gets manifested in right. the drama. Great, thanks. Zena, what's, what's found in thought? <laughs> so, um, I think it's a bit what we were just talking about. So um, what we find in thought is, uh, I, I also shy away from uh, a particular object. Um, and that's partly because, you know, listening to you and Scott talk about Shakespeare, I'm thinking about Plato. The, the, mm, you know, sure, the, your the resolution. Western, right? the Western philosophical right. tradition. Yeah. Uh, who is all about the search. So it's- Right, it's, yeah, the dialectic is endless, right. So you, you set yeah. up this um, uh, form of conversation which mm. aims towards a transcendent that can never be quite achieved. Right, right. And um, it's interesting to me because I, I um, it seems to me that uh, a testament to something like that being the object of, of thought mm. in the sense I'm interested in it, is uh, the idea of growth. So I talk more about growth mm. in the book right. than I talk about knowledge, right? So oh, and growth yeah. is a bit a self helpy term, but right. um, I mean, but um, we become different as right. people. Yeah, or, I mean, uh, growth is like, you know, the German Bildung, right? That's, yeah, that's, not, yeah, I, if, if, um, if I were not avoiding, yeah, that's right. So it's, mm. Culture, it's, it's, right? It's well. It's uh, see, culture has a a class valence. I don't. I want to ah, avoid. Okay, sure. But it's it it helps you become mm. uh, a different, better sort of person. So you're reaching for something more and something right. better when you're. But thinking, then, um, you as you know, speak. Aristotle wrote this treatise called um, "On Generation and and Decay." Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, are are you maybe what you're proposing is that thought has this. Uh, non-biological telos in that, you know, Shakespeare, the sonnet, it's like, you know, everything that must grow must, you know, perish, right? That's, that's all about the immortality sonnet. Is there something um, intrinsically ever fresh and vital about the growth of thinking that does not decay? Um, um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe you need to say a little more about what exactly you're asking. No, I, I, I'm just thinking about uh, growth, right? And uh, biological growth, uh, there's juvenescence and there's senescence. I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. And Shakespeare in the first 15 sonnets, it's all about, uh, you know, boy, you better reproduce. You better have sex because, you know, uh, those are the immortality sonnets. Uh, you know, ironically, I work on poetry, but I can never remember. Like, you, you know, um, I was not educated in in the craft of memorization, so so I can never just spiel, spiel out uh, Shakespeare's sonnets. But you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so uh, yeah, I'm just thinking about biological growth and, and cultural growth and whether um, intellectual growth is something that's ever fresh and ever vital. So, uh, so I'm not sure. And I think that's one of the things, the, the kind of thing you're asking about, I think, is one of the things yeah. that I'm studiously neutral about in the book. Mm. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to say, uh, with even though I talk about Augustine quite a lot, I don't mm. want to say object of our search is um, an immortal truth, which uh, okay. they perhaps when we're out of right. the body we right. right. uh, But I, so I talk about that, and I think that's one way that that, that contemporary mm. thinkers of the past have conceived right. it. But there's also um, the type of immortality that's more common in, in uh, 
20th century literature or in it's, it, oh. it's in the like, Bronte who's 21st um, in in my book but yeah the idea yeah. of creating a, a work of art that endures right well uh, that's a very Roman thing of, of Horace right exigi monumentum are perennials I've uh, crafted a <laughs> monument more uh, lasting right. than bronze right well, I, I think it's drawing on those I mean, it's, it's an interesting example right. of, and I think um, <laughs> It, it, Lila is a, a she, she's a classicist, right? She she goes to the Chiao Classico. Um, I've never read the novels, but I did see the HBO uh, special on. Oh uh, uh, no, um, no no no! You have to. My plane. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Scott, you want to jump in here? Uh, but but I do want to talk about uh, the difference between immortality and and, and reproduction. Yeah. So uh, let's pick up that thread in a bit. The uh, I want I'm interested in talking in thinking through Zena's idea of a refuge. And I don't mm, know if that's yeah. exactly okay. the sure. same same line that you wanted okay. to take but, at that point. Um, but, it, but 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 let me just wrap up this, and, and then let's sure. think about refuge. Um, when you're talking about growth, right? Um, let's use a really classic um, Aristotelian example. Uh, what's why do oak trees grow? Right. What's the final telos of, of a tree? Um, Aristotle might say, well, um, it's to reproduce more of one's own, right? Uh, it's for the flourishing of the species, which is, which is a very biological argument. Uh, human beings um, in the Greek tradition are differentiated from um, animals in that there's an immortal part of our souls, right? The tripartite soul, right? The vegetative animal and, and the intellectual. And that's the part that is closest to the divine. Right, so that gives us the hierarchy of of creatures. I think in the symposium, you know, Plato says it is through biological re reproduction that we can approximate immortality the best, because both of them, as you said, are about the duration. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was my uh, thought about um, growth and. Um, Immortality. I mean, immortality is like stasis, right? Um, and no, it's at the activity. end of the uh, right, right at the, uh, activity, and so at the end of the metaphysics, you know, the telos is, of thinking is God, which is you know a thinking on thinking on thinking, right? Yeah. Um, anyways, this, <laughs> yeah. Just this, it's an act, it's an activity, and the right. the sense in which I'm talking about growth is growth towards human flourishing. Mm -hmm. However, one seeks that out. So I, I right. you know, there's, but but there, it, it's definitely. I think that our activity requires some sense of a telos. That's a subjective mm. requirement. Right. Right. Uh, okay, let's talk about refuge, Scott. You take it. Wait, uh, I, now, now I want to talk uh, okay. about. <laughs> oh, all right, great, <laughs> okay, awesome. Just just one second. Again, yeah. another footnote. So if you, if you're. It's helpful to bring up the sonnets in this context because those first yes, seventeen absolutely. are right. they're they're procreation centered. They're urging yeah. you to do the yes. biological re right. reproduction. But in sonnet seventeen, you have the pivot in the couplet where yes. it says, "You will live twice. You will live right. in in this poem as well and as in, in, your, in right. your child." And then it kind of just abandons the child yeah. procreation it stuff does. after seventeen. Right. So it then, doesn't work. Then, right. then the then the elaboration is more towards the the quasi divine making of making a verbal object yeah, or making right. something that people will read in the right. Horatian sense. In yeah, that's, future. you know, Sonnet 63, 55 about yeah. the, where he's rewriting the Horatian, you know, neither bronze exactly, or, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. And um, the, you know, I neither bronze student, nor the gilded monuments of time shall outlaw, outlaw this rhyme. That's right. Though it's funny because there's other sonnets where he says this is feeble and this will never exactly. last. So it right. kind of oscillates between both yeah. of those poles. But right. I always tell my students what you should do in your notebook right now is say 500 years from now someone will be reading this, mm. and it's it's self fulfilling, right? If nobody reads yeah. it, no one will know, and if right. if they read it, the what? How did she know how, that someone would be reading this in the, <laughs> that's great. In the future? So I oh. mean, it's a it's an easy that's an easy yeah. win. But I do think the, you know the towards the end of the book, I have a chapter on making, and it was a yes. common Renaissance conceit, as you both right. know, to say that poetic or artistic making is something akin to divine making, mm. and it cannot right. last the individual yeah. biological... Right, guard the, right. God the artifacts, um, human mm. being as the artifacts, right? Uh, from Vasari to Michelangelo, right? That's how we're closest to the divine, because we're makers, right? Um, so you had something about refuge, Scott? 
Oh, I just, I mean, I love that that's a com common thread that I think goes through Zena's book is that sense of what is that place of refuge that allows mm -hmm. you to get lost in thought or allows you mm -hmm. to find, find different elaborations mm -hmm. of yourself. And, you know, in some cases, some of the examples that you bring up are, are frankly very isolated kind of bottom of the staircase refuges for an individual. And in other cases, they are in an institutional environment like a, like a classroom or like a seminar. So I was, I, I, I would just love to hear more about your sense of what counts as a refuge and, and are there examples of in, intra-institutional and extra-institutional mm. refuges and what, what they look like, what, what's in common across them? Um, that's a really great question. Um, so I think part of what I was thinking about was um, the, the, it's, it's connected with the idea of withdrawal, which is important. Mm. So, and that, that connects to Andrew's first question about, um, you know, how, how do we respond to contemporary events? Mm. Part of my thought is that um, we, we are probably all, some of us more than others, so the, the marginalized or the oppressed or the impoverished uh, especially, but all of us to some extent um, need to have some uh, in an inner life, uh, mm. something in us that um, to which we can retreat and find refuge, no matter what is going on in the world. So it's a way of, um, you know, one of the things I think is, is bad about contemporary education, it's so focused on achievement and especially practical achievement within an existing set of structures. Mm. But as we're seeing in now in a special way, those, those structures are very fragile and uh, they could collapse and then who are you, right? So education it seems to me should, should give a person a solid enough sense of who they are that no matter what the circumstances, so, you know, you, there's a totalitarian uh, revolution and, and you're thrown into prison uh, and mm. you've got nothing, you know, but, um, but a soap and some matchsticks. Mm. So right. you like, you know, Rodzinskaya, yeah. right, can write, write yeah. poetry by scratching, right. scratching poems into the soap with a matchstick and then memorizing mm. it. Right. Um, yeah. So in a way, that's an individual thing. And I start out with it being an individual thing. But it's, of course, like all learning, something that's nurtured in community. It's a, it's a form of, it's, uh, how do you become a poet? No one mm. just becomes a poet by, mm. um, right. well, you know, grow, if you grew up, like Robinson Crusoe on an island, you, it's part of uh, a community, I, either usually involved with a flesh and blood community, mm. but sometimes something more like what Du Bois finds through books. Mm. Right. Um, and that community is what shapes the inner refuge, but it also is itself a refuge, right? So, you, you know, Du Bois talks about going mm. past the veil of prejudice and to this place where he can have converse, converse as an equal with Shakespeare and Balzac. Um, that's a kind we'll of a refuge, oh. really obvious kind of a refuge. So I, I don't know if that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. No, oh, I love cool. it. I mean, it, it's a, it's. I, I guess it's what I what I really liked about it was the. It, it wasn't saying that it was an either or. Either you're alone or you're in a community. But it's mm. a. It's almost a kind of uh, oscillation or, or dialectic between mm. those those kinds right. of spaces and sometimes sometimes the community can be exactly the wrong mm. place for right. that refuge. And sometimes isolation can be yeah. the worst place for that as well. So it's, it's interesting because it, I, I know, I feel like it's, I know it's true from, to my experience as a teacher, as well as a student. Mm. And I'm just trying to, I was, as I was reading, I was kind of inspired to try to think through how right. can, what, what is the common, uh, what are the common features between those spaces, right. even though they look almost, uh, almost opposite to each other yeah. in some way. Yeah, so I wonder if um, maybe I can jump in and offer some of my thinking about refuge because um, I've been reading uh, Petrarch's um, De Vita Solitaria um, on the solitary life. And one of the things um, he brings out in the spiritual tradition, and you know, he, he writes a dialogue um, called the Secretum, which is um, a fictive dialogue between um, Petrarchus and Augustinus, right? So he's really interested in, in Augustine's, you know, book 10, the uh, chambers of the heart, the refuge in God. You know, I have no refuge except uh, refuge in you, God, right? That's, um, you know, the Psalm sense of the refuge. But emerging from this sense of um, spiritual refuge is 
um, in the monastic traditions, there are actually two types of withdrawal, one that is kinobetic, one that's um, in the community of the monastery. And then there is also the um, aromatic, right, which is you're completely alone in the desert, right? So those are the desert fathers, St. Anthony, um, Pacomius, um, you know, Jerome goes to the desert, you know, for two years. And there, um, I mean, there are like, you know, romantic poets before the time, they believe in, you know, the a pathetic fallacy, right? Because nature, the being in the wilderness is, corresponds to the isolation of their soul. And it's through this spiritual ascesis that you find oneness um, in God. But then there's also, again, then, you know, with Petrarch, the early modern sense that goes to Hamlet, you know, and says, you know, I can count myself an infinite, the king of infinite space and be bounded in, in a nutshell, right? Um, Satan in Paradise Lost says, you know, a mind can make a heaven out of hell and, and a hell out of, uh, out of heaven. Well, he's wrong. He's, it turns oh, out to okay. be wrong later on. Yeah. So, so <laughs> um, how do we think of, of these um, refuge that we create in the kingdoms of our mind or refuge that we find in the physical desert, in physical withdrawal? Like, I mean, there's a world of difference be, being in uh, the topography of Santa Fe versus the <laughs> verdant like... uh, polis of Annapolis, you know, um, 30 minutes from the nation's capital. Well, so I've been thinking about that a bit. Actually, I've been reading Wordsworth the last little bit, um, who I think is a, a more modern person who thinks about landscape. Mm. Uh, and how that shapes an inner life and how that shapes an inner refuge. He's a, one mm. of the great poets of refuge. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Of course, had this effect on uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, you know, that he describes reading Wordsworth and it solves a major mm. midlife crisis of his. Um, so I, it's not something like I do, I do talk in the book a bit and I, I talk about how um, it's evident that time and nature uh, is some way of cultivating inwardness in a way that, frankly, I find mysterious. I, it's mm. not something I know a lot about mm. um, or feel, feel um, comfortable pontificating about. But it's it's a it's a sort of a fact, and that mm. it goes back to the Desert Fathers mm. uh, or other traditions of mm. paramedic tradition. That's not exclusively Western tradition. Mm. Um, I do think that the the Christian Desert Fathers is a bit of a paradox because they. They're they're there with the with the word of God, right? So right. They, yes. They've memorized the scriptures, which are yeah. words. Right? Right. So there, and and also, how do we know about these people? Because we have records of their conversation. Yeah. They Washington. become celebrities, right? Which is again very paradoxic but because it, it's 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 the conversations, right? The sayings yeah. of the desert fathers yes. as people. People come to them and they say, "Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, oh, right." How do I do? It's dialogical. It's dialogical, and so again, how do you? I mean, that isn't that the paradox of sainthood itself? You want to efface your personality so you don't come with God, but then you also gain this charisma. No, okay. No, no, no. You don't. Okay. You don't efface your personality. You're, you're, it's Christian uh, monasticism is very much about the uh, the the splendor of the individual who has mm. their own relationship with God, right? Mm. So it's. Now it is ascetical, so you you right. do give up the yeah. things that you need for right. your personality. <laughs> right. yeah. Maybe that's more of you know the Buddhist tradition, right? Of, yeah, of, I, I of think the true self, be... which is no self, right? Okay. So it's not a it's not yeah. a no self. Uh, I mean, there's a literature about this. I don't want to be too dogmatic, yeah. but um, you know, so someone like Thomas Burton, who's a right. Trappist monk, yeah, mind, absolutely, right. Affinity with Zen, and yeah, like yeah. But it is it is definitely if you think about Dante in the Paradiso mm. with. You know this it's an intensification of this individuals um, living individual lives in paradise. I think that's the Christian vision. So it's and then I think helps a bit with the, I think the tension between the collective and the individual mm. is, yeah. it's kind of built into what it is. It's it's not a, it's not a epistemological. It's not a problem about our understanding or our knowledge. It's something built into the way human being mm. is. You know, it, it's a tension you find in virtually universally. Mm. Mm. I would we're individuals and yet we're somehow bound in communities and yeah. this is why we, you know, we have to spend our lives trying to work out how this mm. sense is made. Yeah, Scott, go for it. I, I would just add or I would, I would throw out there, it, in some ways the refuge part of your book, Sina, felt so um, intense for me was, you know, we, have, we are weirdly in this refuge, forced refuge 
moment of quarantine and being in yeah. our own rooms and right. not being around other people. And, and a lot of people have found it unsatisfying or have found mm -hmm. it more like right. the Pascal aphorism. Yeah, of, exactly. Like, you know, driving you mad of feeling yeah. like I'm bored out of my skull. Right, exactly. And right. that's been the case for, I think, students as well as teachers, as well mm -hmm. as all kinds of different people, yeah. uh, children and adults. So, um, and then you probably, I, you mentioned Agnes Callard in your, in your book, Zena, and I wonder if you saw her New Yorker piece a month or two ago where she said something like, this should be the moment for humanists. Like here we are mm -hmm. stuck in our own rooms, but in fact, we're all frustrated and it, in part because there's childcare issues involved or yeah. it, it's not by your own volition. But um, again, I wondered, I, I just, I wonder if you had a kind of footnote to refuge that, within our, our forced moment mm, of refuge. That's a great question. That, that is something I'm thinking about a lot actually. Um, and I, I've had two different thoughts. One, one more with the, the first part of the spring's crises and the one more with the <laughs> Yeah. The first part of that was that the reason, I, I mean, I was one of the people who couldn't work. I haven't been able to, to seriously work or think, uh, particularly since I've been in quarantine. It's gotten a little better as time has gone on. A lot of that, I think, is anxi it's anxiety about the future. Mm, right. um, and um, it's not really withdrawal because with good reason, we're preoccupied with trying to figure out what's going on and how yeah. we're going to navigate our lives in the world. Right. And especially, I think, educators, honestly, because it's... it's um, it's an extremely, it's, it, the crisis hits us sort of straight in the mm -hmm. face. Uh, and it's, uh, so I, I think in order to uh, find a, find solitude or refuge, one has to really, and this is, I think, also found in all the monastic or the spiritual literature, right. is to surrender to it and accept yes. it, yeah. all that there right. is. And that, that might be really difficult in, in, in a new situation, in a situation where it's unpredictable, in a situation where your livelihood might be at stake. Hmm. So uh, let's oh, um, ask no, this I have question. A right. Let me come oh. back because I have another. Oh, okay. I have another. Uh, because I want to th think about um, this uh, sense of quarantine with what uh, Scott, you have a chapter on constraint. Can we think about uh, quarantine as a type of constraint, right? Um, I'm really drawn to the monastic you know, tradition. And um, once, or, or actually twice in my life, I visited Carmelite monasteries. And in Carmelite monasteries, there is literally, it looks like a prison door, right, when you talk to the people inside. And one of the um, sisters said that uh, this here is not to keep us uh, in, but to keep you out, you, you as a visitor out. And they said, you know, in order for us to devote ourselves, it's like tending a fire, right? Uh, in order to get a fire growing, you need um, shelter and you need, you know, the, um, I, I don't know what, you know, you know what I mean, right? And so strangely, psychologically for me, when Singapore was not in lockdown, right, when there was a lot of anxiety, I mean, I was more anxious before the lockdown because I didn't know what was happening. Whereas once I got to the lockdown, then I pivoted to says, okay, this is my enforced Carmelite experience. <laughs> uh, this is my constraint. Right. Um, this is where I can really probe the limits of human freedom. And can I count myself the king of infinite space, but be bound in a nutshell? <laughs> right. So, no, uh, so, so, so I'm thinking of, of this sense of constraint. And so, Zina, I, I know you have a second thought, but I also want to hear what Scott has to say about um, okay. I mean, Scott is talking about uh, constraints through literary styles and formalistic features of um, poetry and so forth, but stanza of room, our stanza is also a room, right? Circumscribed uh, lines and circumscribed spaces. Right, that's a, that's a great, I, I love that conceit. That's a longstanding conceit dating back to the Italians and, yeah. and going forward through, through, you know, Wordsworth has that great meta sonnet on, on the sonnet, mm, which, which right. begins with the line, nuns fret not at their convent's narrow room. Yeah. And I've, I've, yes. I've chosen, yeah, you I've chosen that, right? yeah. to, be, to be constrained right. here occasionally, which actually turns out not to be a prison. It's, it is liberating in, in certain kinds of ways. And I'm, you know, right. I'm cautious. That's, I, I think that's a risky chapter. I, I don't know if I pulled it off or not. It, I, to try to, align some of the speaking about constraint within literary form and then talking about teaching sonnets in a prison, I think mm. is, is potentially problematic, but I, I do, I, I do want to, I did try to, and I do believe in that sense of the, some of the 
beneficial aspects of choosing to be constrained. I guess that would be the difference for being someone who is incarcerated has not chosen uh, to have that constraint um, in the same way that someone in a monastic community has, or mm. frankly, we have. But the, in terms of, you know, in terms of my teaching, I, I was very happy to focus on the sonnet form in my classes as opposed to a play, which I feel mm. like de demanded the in-person conversation and the give and take that's harder to reproduce. Yeah. Whereas I felt that this concentrated frame allowed mm. us to do this much mm. well in, mm. in within the limits of this screen. Right, that's um, fascinating, yeah. So, but yeah, that, that conceit of the room, of, of choosing to be in a room, I, I think is a powerful one. And I think it's accurate to, to all, all different kinds of artistic creation. Mm. Zina? Uh, so now, I've, now I feel like we've shifted times a bit, but, but right. maybe this well, this will be a different direction. But maybe one that That's you fine. wanted to go anyway. Um, and I just want to know. Um, I'm not really um, keeping track of time, and I mean we don't have constraints because we're just you know uh, having <laughs> like uh, who knows who our visitors, uh, who knows who our listeners might, might be. It's just two, three people. It might just be us. But um, there is a um, usefulness in just the three of us talking, right? And so, and I'm really enjoying this. So let's see where this goes, right? Shall we? Um, so uh, I'm not going to set a constraint on time. Okay, sounds great. Okay, uh, just the, the the other thing I was going to say, which is something that I was thinking more recently. So is that so? One of the things I, I I try to think about, which I find very difficult, is what are the obstacles to um, our concentration? And it's something Scott mm. talked about. He talks about attention. It's something that all of us who are writing about education right now really have to think about because of the internet and the just sort of unprecedented uh, people our age distractions that that brings. Um, but I, I think that, so I, anyway, so I've been trying to untangle over time what, just what is it in us that resists uh, facing the empty room as Pascal puts it? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things, so, and I just said this thing about the anxiety about the future, okay, and then I also think there's something about confronting, in Augustine's sense, the truth about oneself but there's another thing which I think matters, which is, I, I honestly, I, I've started to think that there is also, um, there's a piece of our reality in the world that we, that we don't want to face. And that has to do with um, the, the demands that the suffering of others make on us. Mm. Not, mm. not the, not the demands mm. of Twitter, you know, retweet this horror mm. or that horror or, um, you know, cancel this person or that person. Mm. But uh, what might be a really concrete demand mm. uh, to engage with the people that live down the street? Now, for, for me, in my case, I, I live uh, two blocks from a housing project. Uh, and, you know, there was a shooting just at the beginning of quarantine. This young man was uh, shot in the head, died oh, the next day. Uh, now, that could be a million mm. miles from me. Yeah. Uh, it's to, it's in a way it's a block in another way it, it could be at the other side of the world yeah. and I think that things like that things which are really present to us mm. part of our environment uh, we do not want to have to face these things we do mm. not want to, have to face their demands because we do not want to have to to go through all the awkwardness and discomfort of, right. of trying to form relationships mm. uh, you know, in communities that, mm. are, that are that are suffering, that are hostile, mm. that are difficult, um, and I think that that is actually it, it's it's something I've just thought about, but just started mm. thinking about really. Um, but I think it's very important for thinking about why we want to be distracted and why actually often so many of us are are distracted by tales of injustice or suffering in the world, yeah. you know, yeah. online. Uh, you can see those things as actually just a way of avoiding mm. something that's really right in front of you, mm. and much more difficult to deal with. And of course, you know, I, I live by myself, so I'm thinking about the broader community, of course, but there's also for people who live with others, which is most of us, there's the demands of the, the, the particular human beings you live with might be making on you. Uh, and you, you may not want to face up to them. Mm. Uh, mm. And, uh, it's a, so that's something that is, I think that's in, in the works there. And I, I want to think about that more, but uh, it connects to Dorothy. I know you wanted to ask about Dorothy Day and it connects with that. I think this, uh, uh, one of the things that, 
one of the difficult things, so if, if thinking is a, a way of facing reality uh, in some way, mm. then um, th that involves, I think, ideally a, a confrontation with uh, a lived reality, a reality mm. of one's community. Yeah. Uh, Scott, you, I mean. You... Yeah, uh, I mean, I would, I guess one, question I had again in response to Zena's book was the you're, you're you describe in in beautiful commanding narrative the, the your dynamic of moving into your religious community and then which was part of your sense of confronting reality and and conf wanting to confront the world and and having a space for that kind of thought to flourish the and then I, I think that I, I'd like to hear more about what what the exit was like or what the what the transition was like it sounded like the the position at Jane, it was almost kind of cosmic in some way that you decided this was the time to go back to teaching and the position at St. John's opened up but I I wonder if you could unfold a little bit about what the what the exit from that space was like since it was it clearly was a powerful and important thing that you were seeking and you had it for those three years I think it was a big connect to what we're talking about, uh, which is that it, it was a sense that um, uh, intellectual life, which I had been thinking of when I was in the monastery as being this thing which I was being personally deprived of, <laughs> mm. uh, was, um, was in fact a mode of service uh, mm. and something which was needed by people who were not me, but who were like me. So, mm. so there was a way in which I, what I felt really moved to do was to um, pass on to other people the benefits that I had received. So it was the kind of movement that I've been talking about. That mm. is mm -hmm. a sense that, oh wait, this isn't, um, this isn't about me managing my experiences and having good ones. This is about me being a member of a broader community, and, and what 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 do I have, what do I have to give them? So, and I and uh, that the community I was in was very much focused on person to person service. Now it was not intellectual service normally; it was all other kinds of service. But the personal part of it was very emphasized. Hmm. So I think somehow that piece fell into place, and I realized that that was part of my St. John's heritage. This. Um, teaching as a, a form of personal service, as a way of uh, providing a good for others that was concrete, that was real, that was every day, that every day you'd be brought out of yourself and confronted with someone who, who, um, who you might be able to, to, to help or in some way. So it was a, and it's also a sacrifice, as you know, too, as a, as a, as a teacher who likes to teach person to person, it's extremely demanding emotionally and intellectually. Um, it's much more demanding, I think, than, than lecturing was. Um, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot out of you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and if you really want to help a student become a free person, you have to get into their way of thinking, which is not mm -hmm. yours, uh, mm -hmm. and help them think about what they're thinking about, which is not the same as mm -hmm. telling them what you think. Um, right. So yeah. I, I think that that's okay. I don't know whether, Scott, mm -hmm. you had a similar experience, um, or if you want to talk about the the personal aspect of your teaching and why that matters to you. Uh, I mean, I, I, my narrative is not, I, I think you have, yours, yours starkly lays out the stakes in part because of your bio, the, the, the biographical stages that you went through. I think I, you know, there were a couple of moments where I, I stepped away from the opportunity to be at a larger university. Not, I right. didn't go to it, but I, but I chose another path right. and, and maybe, I don't know if that, I don't know wh what motivated that, but I, I always had a, a kind of vague sense that this is, that I, I did want to end up teaching first year writing and not graduate students or not a large lecture. So I, I mean, in some ways I envy and admire your path because it feels like it made the stakes much more apparent uh, and, and clear by the time you got to where you are. And mine feels a little bit more muddled along the way that or at least in terms of a narrative it's not quite so inspiring you probably were in touch with what really mattered earlier so i don't know, I don't you, know. Should... <laughs> 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 you are not as easily corrupted by this i don't know i don't know about that but i but um but yes i do in in the best sense the teaching that i love is exhausting and 
and mm -hmm. and a, a complex pleasure of of exhaustion mm -hmm. of trying to occupy not let's occupy mm -hmm. other minds sounds so, that's an unfortunate phrasing it yeah. trying to trying to think your way into other spaces and and help others uh, achieve that autonomy that that you you think that they're yearning for that's I, I love that space in it but it's taxing mm -hmm. and it again it doesn't scale up to a 500 person lecture right. or a 50,000 yeah. person online oh. experience I think it also, if I could just add one more thing, I think part of it is, and this is very much part of the, the part of your book that I was most uh, enchanted by and thought was wonderful, was the, um, the sense of uh, learning not being, involving constraints, but having a kind of free open-ended, mm. once yeah. the constraints are mastered. And I think that uh, one, of the, one of the ways in which we as intellectuals or as academics wall ourselves off from one another is by um, wanting to transmit knowledge or information or theories or interpretations or whatever it is um, and transmit those out into the world uh, and that where they can be collected into databases and imposed on young minds or however it is. <laughs> mm. um, I mean, you had this beautiful image of the, you know, you, you feed your students things and then they regurgitate what they've got and you see what might be the, the same. <laughs> <laughs> what you uh, and so I think part of the the challenge of reforming education is trying to figure out how to uh, work against those built-in incentives to um, uh, keep things simple, keep mm -hmm. things uh, systematic, keep things abstract, keep things inflexible, ironically enough, rather than really having to uh, give the space for a student mm. to work out something that's theirs, uh, which I can, it's, 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 it's totally exhausting. You know, I, mm. St. John's has a kind of extreme example of it. I mean, I, a, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, we have, our seniors can write essays on whatever they want, right? Within certain, and that be approved if they're off program, but they were. So, so I decided to sign up for a, a committee and then the, you're examined by a committee of faculty who may or may not know anything about it. So I, I signed up for a committee on Porgy and Bess. Now I'm not a musician. Gershwin. I'm not a Gershwin scholar. Uh, you know, I just loved the, the, the opera. Um, so I spent, I don't know how much time having to study this opera for the sake of the student. Uh, and it was wonderful, fabulous. Like I learned a ton and it's the kind of thing that makes your life worth living. But that's the kind of thing that I think is, is needed it's a dramatic example, but it's the kind of thing that's needed if you really want to nurture mm. freedom and students and let them be really who they are as individuals, um, then that's the kind of thing that we're talking mm. about. There's, there's a kind of mm. economic cost to that that I don't think we think mm. about enough. Uh, and we mm. don't face it straight on. Yeah. Shall, we, um, shall we do this? I mean, well, all three of us love close readings mm. and uh, Scott's book ends uh, with this line from The Tempest, um, Shakespeare's probably last sole authored play in which there are kind of three epilogues and lots of people have uh, thought about this is, is this Shakespeare's farewell to his art, right? Is this, um, how meta theatrical is this? And um, Stefano in Act 3 says, uh, thought is free. Now, uh, Stefano is a drunk, um, um, and I mean, he's basically, you know, a minor character and you give us this kind of beautiful exegesis. And so shall we do um, a little um, thinking about this aphorism, like thought is free? Yeah, I mean, I think I love it because it, 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 it does a lot of what you talk about in your book, Andrew, about the, the work of the aphorism as both being kind of it, before and beyond and after philosophy, it seems to kind of invite a meditation at that moment in the, I mean, there's a great line from John Berryman where he says, this is, this is the most fantastically ironic thing that Shakespeare ever wrote because it's precisely at this moment that Caliban is not free as right. he's, as he enters this course here. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it's, it's a, it's a line that's not free for Shakespeare or he's picked it up. It's already appeared in Twelfth Night. It already mm. precedes him proverbially in the 16th mm. century and going back to Latin authors. So mm. there's this rich moment where you have, I mean, I guess it would be the equivalent of a, 
what's I mean, you end your book on Twitter, it would be the kind of equivalent of a, of a somewhat lazy tagline from Twitter mm -hmm. that someone in a really fascinating way mm -hmm. manages to revivify and ironize when you're you're listening to it. Like you think, oh yeah, thought is free. And you're like, wait, thoughts, he's, that's not free, but wait a minute, this mm -hmm. is an old, this is an old saying. And wait, yeah. this is from King James's <laughs> first poem. And wait a minute, this is, right. and this thought is three, where does that come from? So I, I, you know, that, that I think works as a, as a kind of optimal ideal at the same time that you need to pull it apart and start thinking about, okay, what would enable you to get to that mm -hmm. point to say that kind of statement sincerely? What would be the infrastructure that you would need to be able to reach, mm. reach mm. that kind of, that kind of pinnacle mm. of autonomy. And I, again, mm. this gets back to a number of the things that we've been talking about when, uh, when Zena was just talking about flexibility, I was recalling a phrase that I cite in the book by Alfred Whitehead, the, the great mathematician philosopher, who, where he says, our education is, is rigid where it should be flexible and flexible where it should be rigid. And that feels mm -hmm. like that could be a, a great subtitle for the long history of education and certainly our moment where mm -hmm. like, we're, we're really rigid about certain kinds of things and you have to do this for the test and you have to study and then we're kind of lax in the wrong places where we, that's where actually we should be rigid and we should give more autonomy in some of those other places. And obviously, in the sense that education is an art or a craft, it, it's a fine balance for a teacher of any sort to try to find ways to offer that autonomy, but also offer the in infrastructure that enables that autonomy. And that's, you know, I, I can think of dozens of teachers who did that in very, very marvelously different ways, but everyone's, it's a kind of a dance and everyone's always trying to find that balance between structure and looseness or rigidness and and flexibility and i do think that 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 phrase captures some of mm. that complex dynamic and i i mean that's mm. why i end the book with that chapter on freedom which i think is i'd like to think it's what we're all aiming for but we also but freedom is is not the kind of libertine sense of like just do whatever you want and there's and there's no rules and everybody gets to do their own thing but mm. in fact it's a series of complex steps that you internalize so mm -hmm. that you can do the autonomous stuff. And I guess the last thing I'll say in regard to this is that we're very willing to grant that sense of disciplined, skilled practice in physical arts, like musical performance or athletic performance, where you need to practice this swing a, a thousand times a day. So that way, when the right moment comes, you can look like you're just doing it naturally, or you need to do this dance move over and over again and work through these steps. So that way it is spontaneous when suddenly in the moment at the pinnacle of your achievement, you can make that move, which is natural and autonomous to you, but you've made it, you've internalized it and made it natural. And I think I, I like that as a, as a model for what, what I would like to think that education can be at its best, which is you internalize all of these things. Mm through discipline and it, and it might look like it's rigid in some ways, but actually it sets you up so that you can be the fully autonomous human yeah. subject that is flourishing, is active in the world, can pursue social justice, can do all the things that you wanna do, but you're not short circuiting that process by saying, I don't want any rules or I don't want any curriculum or I don't mm. want anyone telling me what to do. Mm. Um, I, think it, I think it short circuits a lot of wonderful things about education that are, that are enduring. So right. there's, there's my, my spin on thought is free. That's wonderful. So Zena, um, you end your book um, also with a gesture towards um, freedom. Let us remind ourselves of the broad scope of human enterprise as well as the depths available to anyone with a bit of time to think. Let us give free play to the human intellect and the human imagination in an attempt to ground all that is in our hearts in what matters most. Um, what do you mean by free play here, and um, how do you read that with uh, Shakespeare's line, uh, thought is free? So I think I actually, so I, I think I was thinking in that line of something like the kind of freedom and creativity that Scott is talking about. Um, but I actually think I want to, to add something else, which maybe I, I've thought about more since the book was written and I'm trying to bring out in some of the, the little essays I'm writing now which is that I, I, I think that freedom and equality are actually very closely tied. And part of what you want a liberal education from part of one of the, you know, the great mid-century, mid-20th century arguments for liberal education was it, you know, it frees you from the passive reception of opinions from the outside. 
Um, and I, I, that may have, that ideal may have failed in any number of ways. I think it probably did. It's, it's not the kind of thing which is narrowly achievable. But I think we have seen over the course of my life, and I don't think I'm very old, uh, um, but it's, there's a much more uh, central control of what people do and how they act. And um, our educational institutions have become more controlling. That is, there's online learning is a kind of key example. So I, I got in an argument once with um, a, a, an online learning pioneer who came to our college to talk because it was evident to me and to him that no one could become a professor through online learning. So online learning is the kind of thing which the people that really know something design the learning. And yeah, I mean, of, uh, some other uh, people. Uh, uh, some other people right, are sorry, right. so so you just think about that that's a very conventional online learning we don't think about how inegalitarian that is and how much it assumes a body of knowers and controllers and a body of passive recipients and part of what i think freedom means and part of what i think the, the great books tradition has for it um, as hard as it is to keep saying it in this environment, because the great books have a reputation that is, that's, you know, really negative at the moment. <laughs> and you really have to fight it. But one of the traditions that they offer is this sense of, um, you're invited into a conversation with the minds of a past. Everyone is. So, you know, what do we do at St. John's? We, we downplay the role of the professor or the teacher. You know, we are all together engaging in each of us alone and yet together in this conversation with the people of the past with whom we talk as equals, even though, you know, Shakespeare was smarter than us. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think that f freedom to uh, define uh, the, the values that you live by and freedom mm -hmm. to grow in the direction that you choose these are fundamental to small L liberalism and, and uh, you know, I see them crumbling and uh, right. I don't know what our life's going to be without it. I want to try mm. to uh, preserve what I can, mm. uh, that, that sense of freedom, the sense of being a free member of a community of equals mm. uh, and uh, mm. a part of a conversation right. in which none of us has the right to dominate or control mm. another. Right. Uh, um, yeah, that's really beautifully put. So as we conclude, um, you know, we've been in, all three of us have been quarantined in one way or another in uh, social or, or self-isolation. And um, I, I want to go back to this um, beautiful passage that Zina uh, cites in your book, uh, which is from um, W.E.B. Uh, du Bois, um, The Soul of Black Folks. But um, I'll actually read what, what I think is might be his source, consciously or unconsciously. And this is a letter that Nicola Machiavelli writes to his friend Francesco Vettori. And this is written in uh, 1513, uh, in which uh, uh, Machiavelli was a big player in, in Florentine politics. Um, uh, um, as you might know, he was, um, he was a chancellor right, of, of the Republic of Florence. But then through a series of um, events, um, that Republic uh, falls, um, the Medici comes back, and uh, Machiavelli is exiled into this little farmhouse. Um, uh, um, outside of, of Florence. So, so he's, a, he's an exile. And what he writes to his friend is, um, it's such a beautiful passage and every, every time I read it, um, I find it kind of spine tingling. He says, um, uh, when evening has come, I return to my house and go into my study. So he's writing a letter to his friend and he, you know, he says, um, in the daytime, I'm just out uh, I'm like trapping birds, I'm hunting, I'm talking to the villagers, I um, go have lunch in the inn, I banter and I, and I play uh, card games, right? So that's the Vita Activa. But when he co goes back to, to home to study, that's when he activates his Vita Contemplativa. So he says, when evening has come, I return to my house and go into my study. At the door, I take off my clothes of the day covered with mud and mire and put on my regal and courtly garments. And decently reclothed, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where, received by them lovingly, I feed on the food that alone is mine, 
and that I was born for. There I'm not ashamed to speak with them and ask them the reason for their actions. And they, in their humanity, reply to me. And for the space of four hours, I feel no boredom, forget every pain. I do not fear poverty. Death does not frighten me. I deliver myself entirely to them. And it's in the next paragraph where he announces to the world the birth of the prince, right? This um, scandalous text that rocked the world for over 500 years. And this just reminds me so much of what Dubois says in The Soul of uh, Black Folks, where he says, uh, when he discovered his um, neighborhood library, he says, um, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out of the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn or condescension. So wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. There must be some sort of, you know, hidden resonance or, or affinities. And I feel like um, these two passages, you know, in so many ways capture um, the essence of um, both of your books, which is about, you know, um, how to think through difficult times, how to think through these perennial questions. And so um, I thank you, both of you, for joining us in this continuous conversation, right? And it's only through the constraints of space and time that we have to end, right? <laughs> so so, so any final words? Right? Um, no, it's been great. Either, great. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Zina. This is really, really wonderful. Really wonderful. Chat, um, likewise, likewise. Yes, uh, congratulations um, on both of your books, you know.